it gives me an absolute pleasure to welcome today's podcast call John Ratliff, the CEO of the Scaling Up Coaching Organization, as well as Align 5. John, warm, warm welcome. Uh, it'd be great just to have a bit of an introduction to yourself, your backstory, and what uh, what what you do, um, both at our coaching organization and as well at Align 5. Yeah, so going all the way back in the backstory, graduated college, um, was an entrepreneur straight out of school, uh, started with two, well, one, wireless phone store it went well opened the second store sold those when I was 24 years old and started a call center company uh, called Apple Tree Answers ran that for 18 years we did 24 buy side acquisitions in that company and then sold to a strategic in 2012 um, we used an investment bank called STS Capital to do that sale and then partnered with SDS, uh, ran probably a dozen or so deals through them, started a consulting company called Align 5. We teach entrepreneurs how to scale. Uh, and yeah, I'm the CEO of the Scaling Up Coaches organization as well. So uh, that's a very abbreviated version of a long, uh, sadly now over 30 year career. Um, but that's it, sort of in a nutshell. And obviously you and I catch up, you know, as our time is... Mm -hmm scaling up coaching organization but what was it that got you into entrepreneurship what was the the, the driving force that, that uh, got you into everything in the first place you know it's it's funny my my grandmother god rest her soul tells stories about i was you know eight nine ten years old and you know what do you want to be when you grow up and i never said fireman or policeman i always said businessman um the word i didn't know the word entrepreneur when i was nine but uh, yeah, it was kind of always in me. I, you know, it's, it's what I wanted to do from the time I was a little kid. I was in high school, subscribed to Fortune and Forbes magazine and Inc. magazine. I couldn't get enough of it. So um, it was just in me from when I was young. And you went on to found this call center, Apple Tree Answers. <laughs> what on earth got you into a call center business? So uh, my landlord in the second wireless phone store um, ran this little answering service out of the back, like, you know, messages on pieces of paper. And when I sold the wireless stores, I needed something to do. And uh, the guy that built all the equipment for them to, you know, have their little answering service in the back, I got to know him and he convinced me this was the next great business idea sold me equipment and got me started and um the rest was history but yeah i totally like fell into it backwards so you fell into it backwards in terms of the first few years i sense it was pretty pretty tough going but you like it it must be <laughs> entrepreneurs. so neil here's some here's some advice for your podcast listeners never start a business that's 24 seven, 365 with no employees uh, because you'll be the employee working 24 seven, 365. So yeah, the, the early years were terrible. There wasn't a lot of revenue and I couldn't afford a lot because we have to be open 24 hours a day. We couldn't afford a lot of help. Um, so I did, you know, I did most of that. I don't remember 1997. I was so sleep deprived through that year. Um, you know, cause I would, I had a, I had a, single bed in an office and next to my single bed was a buzzer so <clears throat> we didn't get a lot of calls but you know we we got enough that if someone called in the middle of the night and, and i had to answer it this buzzer would go off and wake me out of a dead sleep and um, i'd get up and answer the phone and hopefully try and go back to sleep but yeah it was uh it was not a lot of fun in the beginning yeah but uh, what kept you going then you know, I, I had a moment where uh, it was the middle of the night and I was sleep divided and slept in probably three days. And um, I, <laughs> I got a call. It's like four o'clock in the morning, like m Sunday into Monday. And, you know, I, someone was coming in at eight o'clock on Monday to relieve me and I was finally going to get some sleep. So four o'clock, I'm, I'm asleep. The buzzer goes off and I wake up and I was I had to walk from my bed out to the desk to sit down so I had enough time to kind of like sound like I was sort of awake but I had to walk by the closet that had all the phone equipment in it and 
in this like stupor, sleep deprived stupor, I walked into the closet and I was just going to rip all the stuff out of the wall and be done because I was at the end of my rope. And I reached out and I, I put my hands on the stuff to rip it out of the wall. And I had one of those like out of body experiences where your life flashes before your eyes. And I kind of got a glimpse of if I stayed with it, what this business could turn into. So um, I had my moment and I saw my future and I didn't rip anything out of the wall. And um, the, the sidebar, funny part of the story. Then I went out and sat down and answered the phone and uh, it was Delaware Express. They're a limo company and they do airport runs. So it'd be normal to get a call for them at four o'clock in the morning. And I answered the phone and I said, hey, good morning, Delaware Express, how am I help you? And not a word of a lie, the person on the other end said, oh, I'm sorry, wrong number. <laughs> yeah, so my, my, my whole, you know, I almost wrecked the whole business over a wrong number, but, um, but stuck with it and it got better and started to do acquisitions and bought 24 companies on the way to selling this one and learned a ton. So yeah, yeah the, early, the early days were not fun. Yeah, but again, how often do people quit, you know, just at the moment when actually they've probably done a lot of the hard yards and, uh, that, and that's absolutely what, you know, what I almost did. I almost gave up like right at the finish line. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I know, I know reading through and, you know, again, anyone who's read scaling up will have seen that much of the case studies and certainly around sort of how do you go about creating core values is really built on the work you did at Apple Tree Answers. Um, why, why do you think and why do you invest so much time, John, really honing into creating both value or discovering your values and then really focus on bringing them alive? Yeah, so we, you know, we were in the call center business um, where turnover is just something that you accept. And uh, I was at a conference with a buddy of mine and uh, he runs a business or ran a business in Canada that was very similar to the one we had in the U.S., same technology platform, same operating philosophy, similar setup, like really similar company. And he said, uh, hey, do you track your frontline employee turnover? And I said, yeah. He said, what is it? And I'm like, we're like 115%. And he looked at me and he said, oh, that's fantastic. And I was like, come on, man, that's not fantastic. It's terrible. He's like, well, you know, the industry average is 200 and we're at 150, we're beating the industry average, you're beating us. And I was like, it's just crazy that we accept this. So we had started down the path but prior to that conversation around core values and discovering our core values. And, but we hadn't done a lot to really bring them alive. And it was that conversation that really led me to the, to the idea that if you get a group of people, and the fallacy is you're never going to get 100% of people fired up about your core values but if you could get 65 70 percent maybe even 80 percent of your employees to align around a set of ideas that's way more powerful than just you know showing up at work every day with no idea what's going on so we we really got serious about core values and it was one of the things there were some others but it was one of the things that took our turnover from 115 to about 18 to 20 percent on the front line and I would, I would say core values was probably the second most important thing we did. And it, I, I rant and rave about core values. It's one of the things I talked about. It really gives you three things. It gives you leverage to make tough conversations a little less tough because the core value is the bad guy. You're not the bad guy. So you have to reprimand and you can tie it to a core value. It's way easier than just reprimanding, you know, kind of out of the blue. Um, it gives you a, a capability to make decisions with incomplete information. So it empowers your people to think about how to make decisions um, kind of when they don't have all the facts or all the, you know, all the knowledge they need to make a good decision. If they can anchor it to a core value, they can be much more confident in their decision making. And then it gives you a common language. Yeah. So if, you, if you've done your core values right, they're phrases, not words. And they give you a common language inside your company that, you know, for us, we had seven. But, you know, if, if I said to anyone on the team, hey, how does this align to think like a customer? That meant something specific at our place. What does think like a customer mean? 
and there was a, a you know a story behind it and and a meaning to it that you know was important for everybody so it gives you kind of this common language that um you know you, you short they're shortcuts basically that you know if, if i said think like a customer that was a shortcut to a whole you know larger set of ideas so and one of those core values take care of each other i guess led into some of the amazing work you did with the make a wish foundation i think when i first reached out to you it was literally to learn more about that and how we could help companies in the uk um you know, really take inspiration from that Tell us a bit more about the Make-A-Wish Foundation and how you made such an impact on some of your colleagues' lives. Yeah, so again, after that conversation in, in Canada about turnover, um, we decided to make our quarterly theme that coming quarter, um, the number one priority of that quarter was going to be to reduce turnover, and so we did a theme around it. And in trying to come up with, you know, different creative ways to drive turnover down. We were in that quarterly planning and one of our senior leaders said, well, what if we, you know, created the Make-A-Wish charity model, but we did it internally for our staff. And that led to a program called Dream On. Dream On was our quarterly theme, but then it, it stuck with us for, you know, the whole time we had the company. And Dream On was essentially the, the opportunity for employees to share with us like what, what's their biggest dream in life and if we could make it come true we we tried to make as many as we possibly could come true and and we i think we probably granted over 300 350 maybe 400 different dreams and it, they were like they ran the gamut of you know from i need new tires to my car to i want to go on a honeymoon to i want to have a 40th anniversary party for my parents to we need a tombstone for my grandmother. I published a book of poetry, like all kinds of all over the map, crazy stuff. And that, that program really became the hallmark, I think, of, you know, what we did and who we were and, and uh, was probably the number one thing that, and it turned into something kind of so big on its own that it wasn't about turnover in the end, but it was probably the number one thing that drove our turnover down the, yeah. you know, 18 percent from 115 and you just wonder right now in these challenging times the great resignation um that more businesses can ostensibly take care of one another or really put uh, not just talk about it but put real real action into that particular area yeah you know neil in the middle market i'm a micro economist and i i really believe we look at macroeconomic trends and yeah, certainly there's, you know, a lot going on with the great resignation and, you know, all sorts of other challenges. But if you create a really compelling place for people to come to work and make a difference in the world and be inspired every day, then you're going to attract more people than you repel. If you're, you know, going through the motions and running an average business and then, yeah, people will have a lot of choice, you know, all things being equal. You know, you, you may go somewhere else, but if if you use your creativity, and, and I'm a huge believer, we spend dollars externally on marketing, but we don't spend this, the same amount of dollars internally to build our brand internally with our people. I'd rather have a group of people that were in love with our brand than spend a bunch of money on marketing to promote our brand but our people aren't in love with it first so yeah. i think we do that calculus backwards yeah it's and, fascinating. um Gene brown who you know uh, from the city Bean company talks about having an employee brand promise um, yeah the notion of really honing in about what's important to them and saying, right you can work in our organization this is what you can expect if we fall short of that then you can hold us to account which is i think a yeah. really interesting lesson right now and that and that's how I think you keep people too. I mean, they, you know, especially Gen X and and or Gen Y and Z, you know, <coughs> they want to wake up and feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And if you can create that, that's an incredibly loyal group of employees. You know, they they job hop a lot because they don't get that very many places. Indeed, and you mentioned a bit earlier on about one of your 
strategies to grow our apple tree was a sort of buy and build strategy. How did you go about doing that? And what, what sort of key, key tips and uh, advice would you give for anybody contemplating that buy and build strategy as they grow up? Yeah, so I watched a lot of my peers that were growing through acquisition and they would buy a company and then sort of milk the cow until there was no more milk. And I always thought, you know, you go to all the effort, you know, you put a deal together, you spend the money, you, you, you do all those things, and then you just drain the asset of all of its value and it just kind of shrivels up. Is that the best use of that capital? So, and, you know, some of my peers thought that was the best way to do it. Buy them, don't make any additional investment, you know, milk everything you can from it, and then, you know, it goes away. But for us, we, we were trying to build something, you know, sort of evergreen and with long-term sustainable value. And so when, when we would buy a location, the first thing we thought was, how do we grow this from where it is today? And, you know, that became central to our strategy. And in, in smaller markets, we would change the advertising approach and, um, you know, we would, we would focus on marketing in that particular market. And yeah, we wanted to, we wanted to build them um, every single time. And I would say the 24 acquisitions we did, at least 20 or 21 were bigger the day we sold the company than the day we, you know, did that particular acquisition. Um, so that was our, that was our philosophy. Yeah. And then ultimately you went on to, exit the Apple Tree Answers business, I think by all accounts, you achieved a significant valuation, maybe over and above yeah. what the, um, the industry would have achieved. W what do you put that down to? I mean, you just, just take us through some of the, the key things, because we'll come on to how we, we then start to help other companies you know, achieve a, a great exit. Yeah. So, I mean, when you value a company, there's a financial value, which is essentially a discount of the cash flow. And you have to agree on the discount rate, but if me and you and three other people value the cash flow of a company, we're all going to be in the same vicinity. We may not totally agree on the number, but we'll be in the same ballpark. Um, but to, to get a valuation, and we can all agree on what you know that valuation is, to get a valuation over and above the financial valuation, there has to be some other value drivers in that company that are worth paying for over and above the discounted cash flow. In our case, um, we had a couple things. One, we were really good. We'd done 24 acquisitions. We sold to a public company that grew an ancillary business through acquisition. They'd done about 250, but didn't have core competency in, in the call center space to do acquisition. So they knew that that was their strategy. We became the platform company for them to build around that strategy. So that was number one. Two, we had a really great executive team, probably the best executive team in the industry. Um, and they knew that and they wanted access to that talent. So they paid for that talent. We actually had a salesforce.com implementation that strangely enough, even though they were a public company, five times the number of Salesforce licenses than we had, they actually adopted a lot of our Salesforce implementation because we'd been so thoughtful about it. Um, and our turnover was, you know, 18, 20%, which was, they were already starting to, you know, kind of do some work in the call center space and realized that number was insanely low. So they wanted to figure that out too. So all those things drove them to pay a multiple that was about five times the average industry multiple um, for us. So that's how we, we drove the multiple up. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, such great learnings. And of course now, at Align 5, you've got a proposition that not only helps a company scale and create value that way, but also move towards a strategic exit. We're going to hone in on that in a, in a bit, but why, why, why do you believe most founders, most owners, most CEOs really struggle when it comes to selling their business? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the most important event in most companies' life cycle, but it's the least talked about. So, you know, there might be a thousand books this year written on management and sales and marketing and leadership. There might be one or two written on how to structure and, and you know, take care of your company through the exit process. It's just, it's become a, a real mismatch. I mean, an entrepreneur might sell one or two companies in a lifetime and, you know, an active private equity firm might buy 50 companies this year. 
so the 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 playing field has just gotten completely one sided um and you know it's just one of those things and to me it's you know it, it, lawyers don't represent themselves in court entrepreneurs shouldn't represent themselves in a sale process um you know as much as you know about running your company can be a hindrance in an exit process and you know it's that for a slew of reasons it's a really difficult thing for an entrepreneur to kind of do as a sole source without some outside help whether that's your accountant your attorney and an an, advi an m a advisor but some third party that can kind of help you see what you know you're missing because yeah. it has become a one-sided very one-sided process but often the challenge for these guys is not only that that but more often not their solicitors or legal team or cpa or accountants could actually be have a much more vested interest with the acquirer or the purchaser yeah especially you know it, there's this fallacy that if you're going to sell your company you should find an m a advisor that specializes in your industry um the problem with doing that is especially if and most industries are small and the number of key players are, are small and if you're specialized in an industry, you likely know all the buyers because you bring them multiple opportunities. And it's really hard to bring another opportunity and say, oh, by the way, this one is an outlier. It's worth more than all the other ones. So those industry specialist advisors really are working on behalf of their real client, which is the buyer, not necessarily their, their on paper clients, which are the sellers because they're going to go to that buyer over and over. Yeah. They're only going to sell your company once, but they may go back to that buyer four or five times. Yeah, it's definitely. And yeah. Yeah. It's just a conflict of interest. Yeah. So, John, where, where do owners, you know, again, they haven't got, a, I guess, a playbook. Where else do they go wrong, you know, through this whole process? So the biggest mistakes we see are there's, there's no competitor in a deal. So somebody, you know, called on the phone and said, Hey, have you ever thought about selling your company? And you end up kind of down the road with one buyer. Yeah. So having one buyer tends to diminish value from at least from a negotiating standpoint. And what we always say is if you have to have only one buyer, you have to be the other buyer. So there's competition. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing any deal um, because that number is not the right number. Or this deal's not, you always need to be, you always have to be willing to walk away at any point. So you're at least the second buyer. So there's never a single buyer deal. Um, another big mistake that we see is entrepreneurs start to count the money before the deal is done. So, you know, in their mind, They've already bought the boat and the vacation house and the two new cars that they always dreamt about or whatever it is. And as soon as a savvy buyer sees that the entrepreneur is already committed, the ability to renegotiate or retrade the deal becomes astronomically higher. And that's, that's probably the number one mistake that we see. And related to that is not setting the expectation early on that due diligence is solely for confirmation of what we told you to be true, not for another round of negotiating. Um, and you need to set the tone with the buyer early on that, you know, if they're going to renegotiate during due diligence, that's an opportunity for you to step away and say, no deal. And they need to, they need to know you're seriously committed to no renegotiation and due diligence. So those are some of the bigger mistakes that we see. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you, you also get more focus on strategic buyers as opposed to any other buyers. Why, why is that important to you? Well, I mean, strategic buyers are the ones that are going to unlock that extra value. And knowing that, you know, the, the running your company well is an income event. You know, the better you run your company, typically the higher your income. But selling your company is a wealth event and you only get to do it one time. So if you sell to a financial buyer, you're, you're probably leaving dollars on the table relative to what a strategic buyer might have been willing to spend. 
And because you only get to do it once and because it is the wealth event, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer. Find a strategic, not a financial buyer. Yeah, yeah. Or leave money on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah very so, much so. What are the other emotional games that some of these more sophisticated buyers and play on the unwitting seller? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest one is <clears throat> getting you to already imagine the deal's done. Um, to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in renegotiating and due diligence, kind of pointing out the flaws and, and it can be emotional and, you know, you get to hear about the stuff that the buyer supposedly doesn't like about the business. And that's why we need to reduce the price. So it can get emotionally charged there. And that that's where an advisor can kind of get in the middle and sort of, you know, intermediate those issues. Um, you know, it, knowing your schedule and, and making requests at, at inconvenient times. And I mean, there's, there's a million games that buyers play, but um, the, the big ones are getting you to commit in your head to a deal being done before it's done. That's, that's the biggest trap to avoid. And always, always, always be willing to walk away right up until the last second. Yeah. And if you can, if you can get those two emotions in check, then you have a much kind of higher probability of negotiating a good outcome. Yeah. And I guess that's the playbook that no one's ever had. You know, again, you can read about it, but actually knowing what it is going to do to your emotions. And you tell people to look, you're blue in the face, but they're only ever going to get it the first time. Yeah, yeah, they are at the race course. When I when I run an M and A transaction, start to finish, my joke is I'm eighty percent psychologist, twenty percent investment banker because you are managing it the whole way. I mean, it's it's a gut wrenching process to go through, especially yeah. if you're doing it for the first time. What What do you think, then, John? Is the biggest regret? that people have once they've sold their company if they you know it's sort of uh, they look back and whatever what what in your experience would you say is that is often the number one regret yeah I, you know interestingly something happens if you know if you've run a business for a while 10 plus years you've go, grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle the, the business produces income and you've probably lived to that you know that means or that income and when you sell a company, you're going to get a multiple of that income, but the cash flow goes away. So, you know, it becomes a weird mindset. If you're going to spend the money you used to spend, you either take it out of the principal from the sale or you've invested well enough that, you know, you get the same cash flow. But it's very, very difficult to be invested at that level and have the same cash flow unless you've sold for 25 or 30 times. EBITDA, you're likely lower cash flow than when you own the company. And, and that becomes sort of a weird dynamic to navigate. Um, so we always advise if you could get passive, if you, can, if you can create some passive income streams ahead of selling your company, at least you have cash flow to support your lifestyle. And that's kind of our number one weird piece of advice. Yeah, no, really, really useful. And you also talk about this notion of discovering the Rembrandts in your attic. What on earth are you on about <laughs> when it comes yeah. to discovering <clears throat> Rembrandts? So that really goes back to spending more than the discounted cash flow to buy a company. Right. Um, you know, who's going to value a company over and above the cash flow? Strategic buyer. Why are they going to value it over and above? Because there's something that company does or has, or can unlock for the buyer that they can extract value from over and above the cash flow. So let's, for argument's sake, say you have, I'm going to buy your company and you have a really good customer list, the kind of customers that my company would love to have. So if I buy your company, I get the cash flow, but I also get to market to your customers. And maybe I've determined that that's worth you know, X, some percentage or, or value over and above your cash flow, and I'm willing to pay X to get that value. So knowing 
you know, what, what those values are is really important. And no, as a seller, knowing the strategic value drivers that you have, it's really important. So we use a metaphor called Rembrandt's in the attic. They're like, like, you know, fine works of art hidden in the attic. And the metaphor says, you, me, you, and someone else are, are bidding on a house. We all know the house is worth about a million bucks. I might like the backyard, so maybe I'm willing to pay 1.05. You might not like the front, maybe you're at 950, but we're all gonna be in a range and the seller's gonna be in the same range because the market's been set for the house, the financial value of the house. But then in the inspection process, I'm wandering around the attic and I see hidden behind a wall an original Rembrandt. It's worth more than the house. And you don't know it's there. The other buyer doesn't. And most importantly, the seller doesn't know that it's there. Well, I'm not going to get outbid for that house. If I know there's a Rembrandt that I can get in the attic over and above the value of the house, no one's going to outbid me. I'm going to pay at least up to what that Rembrandt potentially is worth. And the same thing in your companies. You know, you want to think about all right, what do we have hidden in our attic that we take for granted or don't even know is there that a buyer might come along and say, I have to have that capability, customer list, piece of software, could be anything. Uh, access to markets, talent right now. I mean, aqua hires is the hottest thing. If you have a, you know, a really deep bench of talent, people might want to pay for that talent. But all those things are Rembrandts in your attic. And oftentimes things that you take for granted or don't know are there and a buyer would be willing to pay, you know, way over and above for. Yeah, it's a great analogy. You just want to hope then that uh, in between you buying the house and you moving in that they haven't taken that Rembrandt down to the car boot sale. Uh, <laughs> that they didn't much. find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. You also mentioned uh, an organization like STS Capital and the benefits that they, they, they can bring as well. Just, just for the listeners, just, just give us a quick heads up about what SDS Cap will do and why it's a good idea to have someone like that also in your advisory circle. Yeah, so SDS is a traditional M&A advisor. They do sell-side M&A for middle market companies. Um, 50 million to probably half a billion is sort of the range of enterprise values that they tend to to operate in and yeah you you want to have a third party for a lot of reasons number one to you know kind of fill in your knowledge gaps and, and help you with the whole process but two if, if you're especially if you're going to sell to private equity and potentially stay on you know you have to partner with the buyer at least in the short run if not the mid to long run mm -hmm. and it's really hard to have a contentious negotiation with a company that you know you're going to continue on with and and even if you're not going to continue on, you know, it, it tends to be better to let a third party sort of be the bad guy. And, and um, you can be the fallback sort of good cop position. And so having an advisor sort of, it just, it helps you navigate the whole process. Um, and it doesn't put you in an awkward position that you're negotiating with a company that you may stay involved with down the road. And I guess as well, they also are able to go out into the market and determine a raft of potential buyers as well, much more than you would probably be able to do on a global. Yeah. Level. They've, they've got a network of buyers that, um, it, that are, you know, across a range of industries. So they're not specialized in any one, like we talked about where, you know, they're really industry agnostic, but, um, but yeah, certainly there's a, you know, very rich Rolodex of prospective buyers. On the 21st of September, you, Myself, SDS Capital, and we've got wealth managers stuff like are running an event, uh, scaling up towards an extraordinary exit. Um, what, why, why should a CEO, why should an owner, why should a founder give up half a day to really come and learn how you go about successfully, not only growing out your business and creating value that way, but then ongoing to get you match fit and ready to exit for the most amount of money? Yeah, the vast majority of entrepreneurs we come across don't spend any considerable amount of time thinking about the exit for their business. They think, well, it's way down the road. I'll worry about it when we get closer to it. And then, you know, life throws the inevitable curveball. And for whatever reason, you're forced to start to think about exit and you're already behind in the process. So 
it, the the best time to start thinking about your exit strategy really should be the day you start your company. Um, and if you haven't done it then, then, you know, sooner rather than later, because the day will come, whether you pass it on to children, whether you create an ESOP, whether you close the doors, whether you sell to a strategic or a financial buyer and any other number of outcomes, you will ultimately exit your company. And, you know, you want to be thoughtful in the process and, and have the knowledge to do it properly and not have it sort of done for you or done in haste um, and leave a bunch of value on the table. So it's it, whether you're thinking about exiting or not, it's a skill that we all should, as entrepreneurs, you know, completely understand and, and possess. And it helps create your future strategy. If you're not going to sell, you know, in the near term, but maybe in the midterm and you understand Rembrandt's in the attic and strategic value drivers, it helps you make better decisions along the way to get positioned for that ultimate exit. Yeah, no, and I think also making sure that you've got a few more aces in your hand because you can bet your bottom dollar that the business that are looking to acquire you has a very good deck of hands already. So I think that notion of giving you a more level playing field to be able to be successful is, is very much what we're going to be focused on during that 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 session. Um, yeah. Um, just a couple of uh, f- final questions. I'm going to move more now to what we both love doing, in which is in the coaching world. And just I've just lifted this, you know, from your your website. You, know, you talk about the fact that every successful athlete, leader, and record breaker has worked with a coach to reach their maximum potential. Why do you think that sports people pretty much all to achieve their very best would think nothing else of having a coach, maybe many coaches, but yet yeah. so many businesses do not have a coach or wouldn't even think about having a coach? Yeah, and I, I think it comes down to how you see yourself versus how others see you. And, and you know, in, in athletics, mechanics are incredibly important. So a lot of you know, a lot of the coaching is um, breaking down mechanics and making sure that, you know, your movements are, are right. And, and, you know, sports can be a game of inches or millimeters when you, when you really break it down, but business is the same way. And I think we, you know, we, if you grow up in athletics, you've had coaches from the time you were a little kid all the way through. And, you know, if you, if you grow up in, in business, you tend not to have that, but the metaphor is real. I think, you know, business is also a game of inches. It's also a game where we struggle to see ourselves as others see us. And, you know, if, if you have the discipline to bring a third party in to, you know, help hold you accountable and kind of hold the mirror up so you can see the stuff that you can't see internally, you get the same advantages you get in athletics. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about the pandemic and you and I obviously went through that together and spent a lot of time talking about it and and companies that were coached in this methodology outperformed their peers dramatically i'm sure you saw it in your practice that you know you had you had probably clients and industries that were ravaged by the pandemic and and you know a lot of our coaches helped those those companies find a different way and think about things in a different way and and thrive um and that, you know, that probably wouldn't have happened if they didn't have a coach. No, no. And I think, again, not only going through the pandemic, but there's every single likelihood with all the economic indicators that we're going into and challenging economic period, maybe for the next year, two years. What sort of advice would you be giving companies? Obviously, get a coach would be one. What are the things that uh, should uh, organizations be thinking right now in getting battle ready for some tough economic times ahead? Yeah, I mean, and again, I I alluded to it earlier, but I always like to be a microeconomist in the face of, you know, dire macroeconomic circumstance. Um, You know, one of the things when the economy is good and we have tailwinds, you know, at our back, mediocre companies can, can continue to survive and potentially thrive. But when things get tough, the cream rises to the top and those mediocre companies tend to fade away. So for me, it's about 
thinking about the customer experience and stacking as much value as we possibly can in the customer offering and use this opportunity to kind of be in a more offensive position. So acquiring customers, delivering amazing experiences and watching mediocre competitors fade away. What you don't want to do in this environment is be mediocre. I mean, that's, you know, you, you should be obsessed with, with being, and, you know, even if you're in a commodity based business, there's strategies around, you know, being the low price competitor as well. But if you're going to be the high price competitor, you're going to, you're going to trade in the value end of the spectrum, then you can't tolerate mediocrity. And again, that's where having a coach and, you know, help, having that coach help you build a system of excellence can really be a differentiator in a tough, a tough economy. Yeah, probably not the time for amateur hour right now. Time to get professional. Correct. Um, yes. and get really on it. John, thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast, um, which is the Masters of Scale podcast. Just one final thought in terms of knowing what you know now, what is the final sort of piece of advice that you would give to anybody looking to scale out their organization? Um, it, it really comes down to customer and employee experience. I would say the more obsessed you are at creating amazing experiences, both for employees and for customers, I think the higher the level of success. And that's, that, that was always with me, I think, that philosophy, but that's become crystal clear over the last, you know, four or five years that, you know, <clears throat> especially in this day, of a, day and age of, you know, instant reviews and instant customer feedback and instant word of mouth, good or bad, the ability to create that good word of mouth and just create excellent, excellent experiences can be a total differentiator. Very good. Very good. Well, it's actually one of the core values at Align 5 is obsessed with creating amazing experiences. So excellent. that's how we feel about it. Yep. Very good. No, it's a great, great, great bit of advice. And uh, I think right now, as you rightly say, is, uh, well, any, any time, not just as you go into challenging times, but those, those companies who double down on ensuring that everything they do is, is, is with the customer in mind. But also, I think as Richard Branson rightly said, you know, in terms of look after your employees first. And if you do an amazing job of looking after your employees in turn, they should do an amazing job of looking after your customers. Um, and yep. someone who loves flying on Virgin and you're very close to uh, the Virgin Islands and, and uh, well, very close to Necker Island, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're mate? right next door. Yeah. Um, so uh, once again, John, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Your wisdom is always uh, great to, to listen to. And I think uh, listeners will take out so many great insights. Sounds great. Yeah, Neil, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.